welcome to the second WFA podcast. I um, hope you enjoyed the last one. It's for us to reflect a little bit on how we've all felt and how we've dealt with lockdown and COVID-19 all around. And we'll get on in a while to talk about what we think brands have been doing. But I'm delighted to be joined today by Accenture Interactive's global creative guru, John Wilkins. Hi, John. Hello, everyone. From Contagious, and I know everybody's been asking Contagious to change their name, but great brand with a great name, don't ever change it, Paul. But let's start with uh, the human question. How have you been doing, Paul? How have you been coping with all the challenges that uh, this glorious virus has brought us? Well, it's certainly been an interesting period, as you say. We've had uh, various um, people on LinkedIn and so on saying we should change our name because it's toxic, um, but we've sort of stuck loyal and firm to it has got us through since 2004 kind of focusing on that alternative definition of contagious which is sort of you know emotions feelings or attitudes likely to spread and affect others so we try to sort of focus on that you know the redemptive side of, of contagious creativity but what about you personally i mean how how's it been for you ups and downs i found it the toughest where well, I, I took two weeks off in august um as this is a holiday tried to get away from screens completely went into the countryside with my kids and it was getting back to my desk after that two weeks away when you know house was empty wife and kids back at, at school and university and so on and um i was like okay is this it i'm not very happy i don't want to be at my desk in my study much as i love you know being at home occasionally i miss the buzz i miss the office i miss london i miss sort of connecting people i feel as though you know we've been very pragmatic and very efficient um but we've just lost the rough edges the craziness the corridor conversations the bumping into people in the streets and you know those, those random opportunities that happen at live events and stuff so I think I found that on a human level the, the most difficult and not traveling you know I think it was quite nice at first not to have to go through Luton airport at six o'clock in the morning but I've started missing those those kind of foreign trips and experiences that, that, that you get from 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 traveling and expanding your mind and, and meeting interesting people and so on yeah I mean I think that's a cipher of how bad it's got if you're missing Luton airport Something is severely <laughs> wrong in your life. Yeah, <laughs> you, how's your experience been? Yeah, uh, you know, a lot, a lot similar, really. You know, I, I was sort of used to, you know, visiting different countries every other week, and uh, I miss uh, working with my colleagues in other countries and other markets. I mean, I've been through the same hibernating ritual as everyone. I've now got a very ex extensive spirits cabinet. I've learned how to make bread. I mean, I've bought so much useless crap for my flat. It's unbelievable. I mean, you know, stuff that I never will need that will be on eBay shortly. I mean, you know, it's all, I'd like to call it nesting, but it's more just sort of stupidity really. And, and yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Paul. I sort of, you know, initially the novelty of spending hours on teams and whatever was kind of good. But, you know, I do, I do miss the interaction and the spark. And, you know, every meeting takes a minimum of half an hour and they used to be like three minute chats, you know. So, you know, the, the days of kind of, the novelty is slightly worn off. I'm looking forward to aspects of uh, normality. I'm hoping certainly by 2021. What's your tip for making sourdough bread without massive holes in it? um to be honest delegate it to be honest mate get your kids to do it uh. well anyway listen I, I think you know we've all shared a couple of things in common along the way i had the good taking part in just camp but i also john had the great joy of chairing the judges of the accenture interactive awards and just to move a little bit into gear and talk about some work i mean i i love the work that your guys have done around the world and some of it done under the pressure of COVID. And, and actually, yeah. we didn't give an award for one of my favorite ones. But as I sit here in Madrid, you know, I'm remembering the great piece of work that Shackleton did, which was a very simple idea to do with social distancing, which was to get their clients to change their logos in proportion to the two meters social distancing and to convince clients to change their websites, change their logo. So, you know, quite something quite powerful. But could you talk a little bit about the Accenture work on the one hand, and then we'll segue yeah. into you know, the winners and losers that we've seen? And certainly, we found that companies that had a very clear sense of what they stood for, as well as a fairly strong moral compass, definitely 
re rode the storm a lot quicker. You know, they had a real ability to navigate where they were going to play and where they weren't going to play and how they were going to support um, the struggles. So, you know, we, we work with a number of clients uh, around there and then really sort of trying to get a lot of brands to um, sort of seize the moment, both in terms of supporting their staff, particularly if you had frontline staff or staff who were, you know, being challenged by new working environments and, you know, getting them to actively sort of join the fight and support their customers has been interesting. And we've worked with a number of retailers across the world, really trying to catalyze uh, and make the staff sort of critical and front of house. And that's been really important. And, you know, finding lots of clients sort of having to listen a lot more to uh, the tone of uh, the, you know, what, what people are feeling really. I mean, you know, a lot of marketers still really believe that you sort of broadcast messages out from the company. And I think this period has been one where, you know, being uh, tone deaf has been a often criticism. We'll move on to some case studies shortly, but I think trying to get people on with the tonality, moving at relative speed, finding their role within the crisis, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Have they got an active role to play in, in, in supporting either the consumer or their staff has been good? And then more recently, we've been working on some interesting briefs, which has really been about sort of making sure this moment in time is uh, sort of not lost really in some ways. You know, for example, we work with Co-op, a huge retailer in Denmark and you know they their insight from all of their customers is just missing the ability to hug your family and your friends and so we've been building sort of you know effigies and almost pieces of art to celebrate you know what what it will be like when we can get back together we did a campaign in Australia for Australia Post which was more like a you know, a time capsule really, where you could write a letter to explain what it was like living through this so that future generations sort of understood that this is properly a moment in time. And for many of us, this is, who haven't lived through war, this is a sort of historical moment of transition that's fairly significant. So, you know, I think what I found frustrating, and this is probably as much from a consumer point of view as it is working with clients is, this sort of service trap that a lot of clients have been caught in where, you know, they've tried to do this very rapid shift to digital service whilst furloughing significant amounts of workforce. And, you know, they, they've just become impenetrable organisations where, you know, you can no longer actually speak to anybody about anything. You know, it's almost a, a, a trap really between automation and digitization and the reality and the expectation of actually needing to speak to someone in a crisis. So it feels like in some ways, the COVID period has given us time to reflect and think more, certainly when you overlay the manifest issues around racism, particularly in the US and a lot of the issues around Black Lives Matter, it feels like we've slowed down and in some ways have more time to think about what's really important. And that's a really good thing. But in other ways, we've fast forwarded maybe 10, 15, 20 years in terms of the speed of which marketing and service provisions had to jump forward to deal with, you know, the digitization of life, really. So, John, great points. Paul, you know, winners and losers, and I know contagious look at work from all around the world. What have you seen that's great, but really to be slightly controversial? Let's start with what you've seen that's not so great from around the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> losers, oh, God, I mean, I think um, it's, uh, John mentioned it, it's the tone deaf, it's the exploitative, it's the kind of, you know, woke washing or whatever. But I think for me, the most cynical or, you know, uh, was from Subway in Canada. I think it was probably a sort of local franchise operation in Calgary where they had some billboards suddenly up as lockdown was kicking in saying, um, you know, buy any two regular sandwiches and get a face mask for free. At the point where face masks were incredibly by people fighting over them in stores and so on so that just felt really kind of you know crass inappropriate and so on i think any ad usually it was a car ad that had the phrase in these unprecedented times um, also deserves a bit of a whack as well you know sort of just you know we just very quickly when advertising had an opportunity to to kind of shine and, and prove its kind of creative prowess but also that kind of unique role it can play in society to galvanize people and to entertain or to hearten or spread messages or whatever. A number of very kind of cookie cutter ads featuring, 
you know, plinky plonky piano tracks and female voiceovers of famous rock songs at a very slow pace with, you know, stock footage um, just was kind of very disappointing and, and frustrating. Um, I think it's not necessarily an ad, but culturally the most kind of the biggest loser or miss for me, um, I think a lot of the contagious team was the um, Gal Gadot, you know, and her celebrity chums when I think they deserve to be jailed for that awful video they, they created um, when they all sang along to Imagine. So it was like, hey, you guys are all stuck in your little rabbit hutches in Milan and Madrid, you know, with no access to clean air and greenery, but we'd all sing from our mansions to cheer you up. And I think again, that just felt incredibly <laughs> flat and, uh, and tone deaf and just showed that disconnect between, you know, <laughs> which taps it back into the, the brands that really understood the audience and really understood pain points and friction points were the ones that, that really delivered, you know. So I don't know, just getting very segue into the, like, the winners. Like for me, it was things like, um, you know, Starling Bank. And they noticed when lockdown started, one of the one of the friction or pain points for people who were um, self-isolating, so people with, you know, severe medical needs and so on, were suddenly faced with the prospect of not being able to get groceries and stuff. So Starling created this thing called the Connected Card, um, which was kind of mirrored to the person's bank account with a ceiling of like, you know, 200 pounds that couldn't be used online or an ATM, but it allowed a carer or a voluntary worker, you know, someone from the community or a relative or whatever to use that card for them when going out to shop. So I think those kind of, you know, responsive solutions were, were actually pretty, pretty good. It helped to spread, you know, messages were, were things like um, Dettol in India, you know, when they did that sort of TikTok challenge, um, I think they sort of followed that advice that we sort of give from the Contagious Advisory Team, which is uh, be useful or be quiet. You know? <laughs> and, and, and they issued that hand wash challenge where they used the sort of TikTok dances that people do, created their own dance moves, which is around the, the idea of washing your hands for a certain period of time. And that was aimed at the audience of, you know, Gen Z, millennials and so on, who are probably the super spreaders at the moment. Um, and it was a very good way of sort of saying, look, follow this message. Um, let's try and kind of save lives and, and, and so on and it generated a ridiculous number i think it was 125 billion views and that's a brand mm -hmm. you know yes entertaining but also educating and using their platform to spread a very useful useful message yeah and i mean Thank interestingly you. on Dettol, you know they've uh, they've obviously in different markets also put hand sanitizer units into subway systems and it feels like they've created an action brand but interestingly they also you probably read this, Paul, certainly in little old UK, were accused of being tone deaf culturally, weren't they, with their back to work ads. And it just shows that even when you are a brilliant brand like Dettol and you do so much right, you know, occasionally, you know, I think they were talking at sort of happy clappy back to your desks, everything's going to be all right. And they were accused of fairly significantly misjudging the mood. So it just shows it's really hard even for the finest of sort of marketers to sort of navigate um you know what people really expect from brands and uh, i think that tonality thing is so important yeah, yeah. i think utility is also a vital thing during yeah. during the pandemic because the whole thing you tapped into it where you know it pays to be fast so you had brew dog jack daniels burberry and so on like switching production lines to either create hand sanitizer yeah. or masks i think ford was amazing they switched their tv launch commercial to actually um, reassure credit customers from Ford Credit to say, right, okay, if you're about to be furloughed or, you know, there's all this uncertainty, don't worry, we won't be hounding you for the credit on your new car for a while. We'll give you that sense of space. You know, I think the alcohol category, you have people like AB InBev and, and Jameson. So they did things where they sort of supported local bartenders and bars with funds where, you know, you can pay now and drink later just to help people's cash flow come through. You know, Postmates, I think in the States, use celebrities to try and get you to, to spend money in local restaurants and local takeouts, local shops and so on. And I think you know, another favourite of ours was um, Adidas. They created this home team kind of hub where knowing everyone's going to be kind of at home, bored, frustrated, feeling like, you know, that loss of connections, you said. And they, they provided free fitness and meditation classes. You know, so again, utility, usefulness, but still very relevant to the brand, but offering you know, stuff that people really wanted and tapping into understanding consumer psyche and, and, and um, yeah, emotional needs states and so on. Yeah, I mean, a couple of other builds on this. I mean, what I saw a couple of weeks ago in Spain was Santander using one of their celebrity 
Prophet Nadal in an interesting way. So the windows of Santander have pictures of him and what he's talking about is we'll all rebuild together. And it's a clever reference to the fact that he recovered from all sorts of injuries to perform again and we can all do it. So that's, we seem to have moved the narrative on from that. We're all in it together. We'll support you to more pragmatic. Okay, while I've got you both, a couple of other things I'd love to touch on. I mean, looking at the color of my hair, you know, I thought Mark Reed put his foot firmly in his mouth when he was talking about, you know, thank God WPP have got lots of people who weren't around in the 80s. And it smacked of unnecessary ageism. I mean, can you talk about that a little bit, John? It reminded me of a talk that uh, myself and Ivan Pollard did at, uh, I think it was Ad Week in New York last year, where we talked about the dream agency. And actually, David, I think you were the chairman of this agency. But <laughs> Ivan and I both said, well, but, but, we, but basically, because we were saying, if you're going to launch an agency today, it has to be digital ready, right? So, which is where I think the trap that maybe Mark got caught in, because he's a good guy, but you've got to be digital ready, but you still need uh, wise, experienced leaders because, you know, business scenarios, marketing scenarios, you know, creative strategies, they're not real, they're still fixed, even though the terrain might have changed. And, you know, Ivan actually, interestingly, as global CMO of General Mills or wherever he is, he said, you know, you would want the perfect blend of, diversity, but also old and young. And he made a real point of saying wise heads still have a huge role to play, even in a new startup that could be very digitally focused. So I, I feel sorry for him in a way, because you get caught out of context and you say something, and I'm sure he didn't mean it because he's a pretty smart guy. But, you know, I mean, ultimately, I think diversity is an everything word, isn't it? It's an everything. You need everything to be truly representative. It kind of bit on the bum a little bit because it just came across that the whole network is about, you know, younger means cheaper. So it's a cost saving yeah. exercise more than anything. But I think also strategically and creatively, you're, you're, you know, you think where the spending power is, it's certainly not in the, uh, the under 25s, is it? You know, so you're sort of, <laughs> you're missing out on a major part of the market um, culturally and, and, and creatively. So I think that, that way is where it backfired. I think there was a big debate raging on Twitter, as you can imagine. And I think someone pointed out that if you look at other sectors, so who's winning Nobel Prizes, Oscars, Pulitzers, art prizes, it's people in their 50s and 60s, you know, so there's still a huge amount that people in, in that age demographic can, can contribute. And I think just back to George's point, it's all about the mix, isn't it? It, it is about diversity of, of everything. Um, and just to exclude age for the, for the sake of it seems redundant and reductive. Um, let's switch to one other theme uh, before we wrap is through all of this, you know, the Black Lives Matter has been front and center. I mean, I, I mean, it was a while ago now, but I was very impressed with the stance that Lewis Hamilton took, the fact that he wore a t-shirt when he was winning a race. And actually this is brought into sharp contrast should you mix sport and politics and when to and when not to? And it's a tricky thing. But can, can you just, as we get into the closing bit, reflect a little bit on Black Lives Matter, what you've seen, how you're feeling about diversity? Sure. John? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm like a, a huge advocate and supporter of, uh, you know, the sentiment behind Black Lives Matter. I don't know much about their organization and I've read sort of slightly different things, but I don't even want to get into that because, you know, the levels of uh, racism that still exist in our culture and society are so huge that it almost doesn't matter. You know, the most important thing is everybody should use every platform they have to bring racism down. It's a completely unacceptable cultural force in the 21st century and it's shameful that, you know, I mean, actually one positive I mentioned through COVID is people have slowed down because one thing, you know, I study American news, probably like a lot of us, and these killings go on every month and have been going on forever, but the world slowed down and suddenly everybody stopped and said, this is completely unacceptable. And I, I think that, you know, racism, you know, starts at an early age. That's the sad truth of it. And these sports people are role models and if they can incinerate or help to incinerate racism through their influence then I think it's a fantastic thing so I just don't think it's even a debate I mean you know all of us have spoken to people all lives matter it's not a debate you know we're not all being systemically pre prejudiced in our daily lives 
and people of color have been. So it's not a debate. Black lives clearly are all, it's all of our interest and pejorative to defend and support the sentiment behind this. Exactly what John said. I mean, I, but also I think to your original question, I think, yes, you know, I think we live in a very, you know, visual culture and just the iconography, the sort of visual power that sports people bring. So to see, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, anti-racism messaging in things like, you know, the US Open tennis final or Formula yeah, One football yeah. is incredibly powerful. Um, and I yeah. think also, don't forget, a lot of these athletes are endorsed by brands. And I think they must know that these brands have got their back. Otherwise, you know, so it's one of these things where it supersedes everything. And I think it's a very, very powerful um, thing to see. If you look back to when Colin Kaepernick took the knee, you know, Nike really, I mean, you know, I don't know this, but what I've read is they had a very, very quick center ourselves. You know, where do we stand on this? Well, we built a business off you know, a lot of African-American sporting prowess, we've got to stand with him. They made that decision very quickly. We've, we at the WFA have used that as a case study. I think, Paul, you've shown it. And we talked about the trainer burning and potentially the, the negative impacts that they received, but it was instantly the right thing to do. But, you know, Colin Kaepernick, he, he, he led that. And if Lewis Hamilton can lead other brands and, you know, McLaren are doing the all black car, that's a fantastic thing, right? So, you know, they are the driving force. You know, I think what's interesting now is probably historically brands kind of shaped talent. I think in this particular instant, talent is shaping brands. Just as a little way of finishing off the Colin um, Kaepernick story was that because Nike did stand by him and yes, you know, they, 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 they took flack initially, but in terms of the NFL, who sat on the fence and didn't really want to have a perspective on it, their ratings went down, their kind of brand, brand, brand image went down. Nike, you look at their share price and, 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 and what, where they've gone since, you know, I think it shows that sometimes you do have to stand for something. Otherwise, you stand for nothing. And I think um, yeah. Nike were just, they knew, it was that classic thing, they, they knew they were going to piss people off, but from their attitude, it's like, we just have to piss the right people off. And they did, and they don't <laughs> care about it. <laughs> yeah. what, what a fantastic note to end on. Um, guys, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Remember that one? We just have to piss the right people. Till next time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, everyone.